and you are an official team doctor for kings 11 punjab so please uh, uh, dig in and share all your experiences how did you get into it and how many years has it been it's also just being at the right place in the right time and for <laughs> that is the also like even prior to getting into cricket i was the uh, team doctor for the indian team okay. at the asian para games it does not matter how fast you can go it does not matter how long you can go it does not matter at what pace you can go it does not matter how what distances you can go it does not matter how uh, intense was your session it does not matter how hard high was your heart rate what matters is as long as you're recovering well as long as you are showing up every single day after an intense session after a slow session after a medium session and you are able to show up with the same intensity the same vigor and the same enthusiasm that's when you've truly unlocked the fourth pillar of uh, triathlon training which is recovery recovery is so important for any triathlete marathoner or athlete in general that you know uh, this one difference this one key area makes all the difference between winning losing between getting injured or enjoying the process and between high performance and low performance so to talk about recovery today we have a very special guest uh, on our podcast dr shrinivas shrinand who's based out of bangalore who's the head and founder of elevate performance he's also the uh, team doctor for kings 11 punjab he's helped countless athletes uh, right from cricketers to uh, endurance athletes runners marathoners triathletes swimmers cyclists so you name the spectrum of endurance athletes that are out there have probably had some kind of connection with dr shrinivas a uh, amazing individual i have personally had the you know good fortune of actually working with him for a couple of my injuries and recovery process i would want to uh, welcome him uh, for you know all things recovery and if you feel that you know there are areas of your uh, you know improvement there are any specific injuries that uh, you want help on feel free to comment and we will have the entire conversation put out on the trifantry podcast uh, i would i would recommend that you watch this episode till the very end because uh, some amazing insights are going to be uh, spilled over by dr shrinivas dr shrinivas Welcome to the show Dr. Srinan Srinivas thank you so much for taking out your precious time i know how busy you are and how swamped all the international cricketers and athletes might be uh, in your dms all the time help me with this help me with that so i'm so glad you can make it today thank you so much for having me over nishant it's a real pleasure that you to uh, have me on board i'm happy to be here Uh, let's just start at the very beginning how did you come to this field uh, of medicine and you know why did you decide to actually specialize in sports medicine and recovery uh, take us through your journey and then we start with very basic questions of getting hurt so sure, let's sure. yeah let's absolutely let's so so my thing is i was a professional swimmer and like i've gone on to okay all right sure i've uh, i've always been inclined towards sports because ever since i was a kid i was always into swimming in fact i went on to swim uh, professionally and uh, represented india in swimming and uh, as i uh, during my when i when i was continuing to swim professionally i took up my medical seat and i was uh, lucky enough to be able to manage both mbbs and professional swimming at the same time wow. and obviously as i was studying more about the human body mm. and at the same time when i was doing sport mm. it made help me bridge the two and that's what really led to my interest towards sports medicine because mm. i felt there was a lot that wasn't being done 
Hmm. Also, a few personal experiences like as an athlete, even I got injured during my swimming days, and unfortunately, the only advice I got then was to rest it out. There was no proper rehab program, and I'm talking about late '90s, early 2000s, where uh, about 20, 22 years back. The only thing that I was advised is rest, mm-hmm. and I think that still happens these days as well. Yeah. So I feel that was a bit of a thing. Then so that was my starting to, uh, step towards sports mm-hmm. medicine, and I've always been an advocate for an active lifestyle, and I feel that. Sports medicine is that's why I've taken up sports medicine, not just for recreational athletes, but also to for non-athletes as well. Mm. Applying the concept of sports to them and making them exercise makes a lot of difference. So that's my inclination towards sports medicine. And they've always been that. Yeah. So it's all started because of probably a personal interest and then uh, uh, extrapolating it to your uh, profession, so to say, right? Uh, under reading more about it. Uh, was this like a conscious choice that uh, this is what I want to do after your MBBS uh, so that yes. I can learn more and be, become a better version, a better athlete? Yeah. So, I mean, at the start of MBBS, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what that I was going to do. But mm-hmm. towards the end of, uh, towards the end of my MBBS, mm-hmm. I kind of pretty much knew that I wanted to do sports medicine. Only thing I needed to figure out was how to get there. Mm-hmm. Because so there are different ways of doing it, and uh, in different country in, in in India, it's a specialization after you finish your uh, MBBS. Okay. And uh, some countries like the US, it's a super specialization after you finish your oh. regular. So it depends. So I went on to do my uh, after MBBS. I even I didn't pursue the specialization right away. I wanted to build up on my work experience, see if there's any other field out there. So mm-hmm. went on to work in different departments, different fields. And then finally, uh, I did my sports medicine from the International Olympic Committee. Mm-hmm. They had a course, they had designed a two-year course, which mm-hmm. was specifically for uh, doctors from countries which don't have any sports medicine, wow. uh, let's say a sports medicine mm-hmm. field per se. I mean, we do have a couple of colleges in India now doing offering an MD sports mm. medicine, you know, but this was more designed for that, trying to fill in the blanks and trying to help a nation proceed better with it. So that's where my sports medicine degree came in from. And but you're right, you're absolutely right. It usually I think uh, you do have an idea that I want to do this, this is what I want to do, but there's that one personal interaction that is the spark to mm. set that thing on fire. Now that decides, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's the case for most of us, I would uh, really? say. But yeah, but I think that's uh, definitely something uh, I feel you're right. Absolutely right. A personal interaction is the, mm-hmm. is the initial spark. And then you just have to charter a path through that let's see that. but uh i would uh i would want to compliment here and also probably dig a little deeper uh, in terms of your choice of uh field uh, of sports me- medicine because see in in india we generally and this might be a perception and help me correct it uh that if you get into general medicine or very specific let's say a dental doctor or maybe mm. a ED surgeon or something else uh those are volumes game so yeah as a business and right. uh, at the end of the day, those are probably 80% one-time interactions and 20% further sessions. And right. you know, there's already so much inbound interest that you don't yeah. really have to go out and educate people that yes. this is what you have to do. That is what, and you as an athlete, as an endurance athlete, probably had that long-term mindset and you're trying to solve a much harder problem, which requires a lot of education lot of uh, pull i would say rather than push uh, sorry a lot of push rather than a pull kind of a product yeah. why like why are you trying to solve a more difficult problem here i mean uh, because i think a lot of things can be because i probably it all comes down to a personal lifestyle you see people around you and then you feel like so i mean just to give you a little more in context hmm. i have two practices one is the sports medicine practice yeah and a second half of my day, I am a, I have a GP practice as well, okay. where uh, I have spent a lot of time treating a lot of people with diabetes, high blood pressure, and all of that. Sure. 
and i feel that uh one of the few that is one thing so when you're there do you see that so many times that just a few lifestyle changes hmm. can make someone uh, the, one of the biggest challenges i face when i as a gp is that hmm. uh they let's like, say a person just been diagnosed with high blood pressure hmm. a 35 year old male who's just been diagnosed with high blood pressure hmm. and the first thing they tell me is like do anything doc but don't give me tablets i don't want to take tablets for the rest of my life hmm. and that kind of uh, get me going okay but then that is something for me i can't do anything over that i can do only you have to meet me halfway at that point of time mm-hmm. i can only tell you do this do that do this it's like mm-hmm. it's like i mean i'm quite sure for you as a as a iron man coach mm-hmm. if somebody comes and tells you make me finish an iron man mm-hmm. you can give them the program you can tell them this is what it is you can't do the swimming for them you can't do the yeah. cycling for them. that's <laughs> one that's one thing so that that is one of the few things that i think and it is not it is not as challenging as i mean it is challenging but it's it's not as challenging as it looks from the outside it just requires a little bit of perseverance a little bit of patience a little bit of pushing them prodding yeah. them in the right direction yeah and uh, what we normally talk about is more about perception you know yeah. you know like if i can change your perception of a particular mm-hmm. issue then that makes a lot of uh, difference I, and i think the primary reason if you ask me why i do it is like there's no one else out there doing it yeah yeah there's no one else out there doing somebody has to do it absolutely and uh, so yeah that's the thing this is a very important uh, point you've touched here and i would like to uh, segue a little in the conversation in terms of you know active recovery or uh, uh, you know mobilization or physiotherapy uh, as a branch of science where uh, you are literally using biomechanics and uh, uh, mobility and various recovery uh, techniques to heal the body uh, but the issue is that most indians and even experienced runners or triathletes end up ignoring a lot of problems which eventually end up becoming nagging pains or it becomes in worst cases it kind of end, ends up becoming cold shoulders or cold uh all of those kind of uh, scenarios end up happening because there could be many reasons and i would like to hear some of the reasons from your perspective in terms of what goes behind such patients why are people not actively going out there and seeking help and moving out of their comfort zones and you know why is this why is there a bit of uh taboo might be a strong word but ignorance or uh, reluctance might be um, of yeah i would uh, see i see i i can totally understand aven you're right uh, lack of awareness is probably the number one reason mm-hmm. and uh, you'll be surprised that it's not just at a recreational athlete a lot of professional athletes themselves don't know what it is i mean like oh. like for example like a recreational runner has mm-hmm. this chronic ankle pain mm. or a chronic knee pain for that thing mm. the first thing they're going to do in today's world is to look it up online <laughs> yeah and uh, we have a thing in uh, running in runners among recreational runners is like i know this is like if you speak to another the, the, and the typical thing is to talk to a peer yeah <laughs> because you don't know where to go because uh one is you're scared to meet an orthopedic surgeon mm or any doctor there's a fear there I'll, i'll come back to one the one is a lack of awareness you don't mm. know where to go mm. the second thing is you look it up online and then you speak to a peer and invariably the diagnosis itb irritation <laughs> this yes. is i've had a lot of clients who come in and that's one more thing i'll say we in the sports medicine field i don't call pe- we try not to call people patients because they're not sick they are not sick we call them clients because <laughs> you have an issue you're not a, you're not unwell you're not thing this have another problem you're dealing with it we'll mm-hmm. teach you how to deal with it so that's mm-hmm. one thing even like the physiotherapists who come work under me you know i try to educate them about that mm-hmm. people who are coming here are not patients they are clients they can do they're much stronger than most of us they much they are better endurance than most of us out there so mm-hmm. we don't call them patients that's all okay. i mean that's a different uh, deviation yeah. slight deviation so the second thing they go to a 
they they talk to a peer about it. A peer tells them it depends on again depending on what that peer has gone through. Mm. If that peer has had some similar knee pain and he's tried some he or she has tried some particular stretch mm. and that has worked out for them. They'll tell hey do this stretch. Oh my God, your pain so will get sorted really. out and, and they do that. And it probably gives a temporary relief. It's like or they say hey go for a massage, uh, you'll be fine. So. What happens is it becomes a pattern. So these guys think, okay, every time I run, I think it's normal to have this pain. So I go for a run, I come back, I'll get a massage and I'm absolutely fine. Again, the next day I go for a run, I come back, maybe weekly once I end up getting a massage. So it's like, in simple terms, it's like whenever I have pain, I'm just popping in a painkiller, but a different kind of hmm. painkiller. Hmm. So that's the typical mindset. The other thing is, this is the lack of awareness part. Hmm. The other thing is the fear. Hmm. The biggest fear is like, what if I go to a doctor and the doctor tells me, okay, don't run anymore. Hmm. That is a very, and a lot of these runners, the, the hmm. category that you spoke about, hmm. a lot of them are people who never, a lot of them, I'm not saying not all of them, a lot of them hmm. are people who wouldn't have taken part in sports during their school days, college days, and they've started taking it up as a, a recreational hobby or mm. just a betterment of health in their professional career. Mm. And now, as a co-athlete, I know the the endorphin high you get from a workout, nothing beats that. Yeah. So they don't want to stop that. Mm. So they are ready to accept that risk of bearing the pain and continuing mm. to run and uh, not... Uh, you know, like at the risk of uh, not wanting to hear someone say, take no. a break, stop yeah. it. Because a lot of people do that. They'll be like, they go to a doctor and this is, I'm not bad mouthing any doctor, but this is what I'm telling you from experience. They go yeah. to a doctor, doctor said, uh, don't run for three months. So you yeah. don't run for three months, the pain is not going to be there, but you not doing anything to rectify that uh, root cause. So that's something which is very, very important. So. That's one of the main things. So, and also these niggles, right? They start off very, very subtly. Mm. Like you won't even realize it. It's mm. there. You just think it's a normal process. And then three months, six months or one year down the line, you're suddenly, yeah. every time you run, anytime you cross two, three kilometers, the knee starts hurting. So this is mainly, I think it's a combination of the mm. fear plus lack of awareness. That's, yeah, that's pretty much the thing. Yeah, I think uh, uh, what uh, what we are trying to do here is obviously initiate a conversation and I'm very sure that you would be speaking with a huge number of individuals on a daily basis who come with a mindset of, uh, I'm okay, Aap, why don't you do this small thing for me and I'll be fine. Uh, I, some, In fact, most people look uh, doctors in a way, in a weird way, if they don't give any kind of medicines. People... Yeah by default want to get some kind of medicines that you give me five days of this, 10 days of that. And, you know, people start having this weird uh, mistrust or whatever that might be perception. If, if this doctor does not give you a medicine, probably was my, uh, you know, fees and all of that, was it even worth it? Yeah. I would have just Googled yeah. it and I would have come to know, which is like so strange. No, you're absolutely right. Because I've had... Uh... Uh, this is something I've experienced more in my GP practice. Hmm. So many times people would have uh, they would have gone to a particular another doctor or another clinic hmm. and like say yesterday, this morning hmm. and medicines don't work overnight. They need some time to work. It's not going to do, it's not magic. Yeah, It's going to take some time. So I would have seen a doctor. I had this, I think two weeks back I had this incident and then uh, this lady went and saw a doctor in the morning for, I know it's not sports, but for cold, cough, fever and all. Mm -hmm. The doctor has given her some medicine. Mm -hmm. She's come to me in the evening saying, uh, I started these medicines this morning, but I haven't seen any uh, improvement. <laughs> and she started, I'm like, okay, so I went, I examined her, I had a look, I checked her oxygen. I listened. Basically, you know, a typical medical examination. I did a full examination yeah. of her. And I reviewed all the medicines that the do other doctor had uh, given. And everything was correct. You just need to give it some time to yeah. work. 
So I told her the same thing. Hey, listen, the medicines are good. Continue the medicines. You don't have to change anything. And you, I spent my usual 15, 20 minutes talking to her. Speak, and then she's like, okay. And then she's like, then she's like, do I need to pay consultation? Mm. <laughs> I was like, uh, yes, because I did. I mean, I did make sure you didn't need anything extra. But, yeah. but you haven't prescribed any medicine. Why should I pay consultation? So that is unfortunate. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's the mindset. So what we've been doing, what I've been doing in the mm -hmm. clinic is in my sports medicine clinic, keeping one of these things in mind. Mm -hmm. When I, uh, so my, as I think, when I say I'm an exercise physician and I talk about people doing rehab and all of it, I put the exercise in a prescription form. So, I mean, yes, that, that is one thing is the uh, thing, but people also understand how to do the exercise better. Yeah, yeah. Imagine if I just tell them, okay, uh, yeah. uh, somebody comes with uh, lower back pain, and then you say, you just need to strengthen your core, core strengthening, yeah. and you send them back. Instead yeah. of that, if you write a prescription and say, do this many reps of this exercise, this many reps of this exercise, it's easier for them to follow. True. So we try to give exercise in a prescription form, as funny as it sounds. Yeah. It makes people a lot more uh, 100%. compliant with it. It's just so much easier for them to... 100%. Uh, I've uh, personally, you know, as an athlete, I've been uh, into the field for about 18 years. Started running way back in 2005 and it's mm -hmm. been 18 years. And because of the, you know, longevity in the sport, you end up obviously getting hurt somewhere or the other. And then you do seek out help uh, from various sources and what yeah. i've seen this which is which is such a fundamental thing which you have just mentioned that even if you go to a physiotherapist for once or twice or thrice mm. they will tell you that let's say your glute is tight or this is tight mm. and you should do this and they will also show you the exercises right. four five of them uh 10 second hold 20 second hold this that mm. all of that but by the time you walk out of the clinic you would have forgotten half of them and the next mm -hmm. day you would have forgotten probably remaining and that's why i think even from experienced athletes like me or various people I know, the compliance rates are so low. Correct. There's things, you know, just probably five days of strengthening uh, with those basic exercises can lower yeah. your pain levels by probably 20-30%, but we end up forgetting. So this yeah, amazing thing right. that you just mentioned about compliance uh, and yes. by writing, the act of writing it down, journaling absolutely. or whatever that people might call it is absolutely. better. No, you're right. So, because so what I've done is, uh, so basically my sports medicine clinic is called uh, Elevate Performance. Yeah. And uh, what we do at our rehab clinic is I, whenever someone comes in for an injury, mm -hmm. I try not to call them to the clinic for rehab more than twice a week. Okay. So, the whole concept is, yes, you still need your 5, 10, 20 sessions of, or more, depending on the extent yeah. of the injury and all of it. Hmm. So what we try to do is uh, we don't call people every day. Hmm. I, because strength takes time to develop. A lot yeah. of rehab is based on strength. If I call you Monday to Friday and make you do 10 different exercises, it's not going to help you whatsoever. Yeah. Instead of that, if I spread those five sessions, let's say twice a week, hmm. so that's five sessions spread over two and a half to three weeks approximately. Hmm. The chances of you getting better, the chance of you being pain free are a lot higher. higher. So the whole concept is to, let's say somebody comes in on a Monday, we mm. uh, teach them some exercises and we mm. tell them, we want you doing these exercises Monday till Thursday. Mm. Come back to us on Thursday. Mm. We'll see what progress you've made on Thursday. Mm. We'll re review the exercise. If there's good progress, we scale up the exercises, mm. add in some variety, make it a little more challenging. Review them again on Monday. Mm. So this does two, three things. One is it does uh, help improve the compliance. Mm. Because if, if you know that you have to go only twice a week compared to every day, because physiotherapy is something that can't be rushed. Rehabilitation mm. exercise can't be rushed. It will take out two hours of your day. Yeah, yeah. One hour of exercise, getting there half an hour, coming back to your office right. or home. It takes a two hours of your time every day, which is a lot of time. Sure. In a daily routine, two hours is a lot of time. So instead yeah. of that, so you don't you you start losing interest. You start losing. Uh, you keep. Mm. And what happens is you do rehab for the sake of doing rehab. Mm. You're not doing it because you're starting to understand why you're doing it. Mm. 
So we try to keep it, space it out, try to make sure that they understand what they're doing. And when you ask them to do these exercises on their own, mm. now let's say you are doing an exercise between uh, from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Mm. You know that, hey, you're coming back to the clinic on Thursday. Mm. You have to do the exercises. Otherwise, the physiotherapist will be able to see no progress, lack of progress. Okay. Or thing. You can make small degrees you can make out. Oh, really? And so this also helps you person. become independent. Hmm. So at the end of the day, when you finish your rehab, hmm. let's say you do 10 sessions of rehab with two sessions a week. That takes about a month to finish. Yeah, yeah. And a month is what you need. 10 days will not do the draw. Absolutely. A month is what you need. So at the end of a month, you've done continuous exercise for a month. Hmm. And you are also confident enough to do these exercises on your own without supervision. Yeah. But that's how we plan our year. Your compliance is something which is sad. even then people once they feel good after three or four sessions, that's also happened. So many times people feel good after three, four sessions, they forget the pain, mm. but they they have not done anything to prevent it from uh, Re- happening again. Again, or reduce the chances. I wouldn't say prevent it because no rehab or prehab. <laughs> program is 100% uh, 100, yeah. injury thing, at least reduce your chance of it happening hmm. again. And one month later, again, they're back in the clinic for some dealing with some injury or something. So yeah, that's the thing with compliance. So we try to figure out a way to make it as uh, compliant for the client so that yeah. they also enjoy their rehab and they become independent at the end of it. No, I, I agree with you. I think uh, I've been to your clinic a couple of times, uh, even with my mother and for my mm. injury as well. And uh, the way you take care of uh, the par- uh, the patients or the, the clients uh, <laughs> is uh, yeah. exceptional right from the very beginning of actually hearing the in- end-to-end uh, uh, prognosis or diagnosis in the beginning itself. Because uh, I think... Uh, I shouldn't be uh, making a generic generic uh, statement, but I've seen a lot of doctors just hearing maybe a couple of minutes of uh, uh, you know queries, and then they'll just make some assumptions. So it happens right. in some of the fields, but here you are actually spending fifteen to twenty minutes and asking literal qu- questions, which probably we even we didn't think about. What did you do the week before? What uh, shoes were you wearing? Did you sleep all right? How did this happen? How was the entire thing? Which is so amazing because you know at end up you end up getting all the answers in the conversations itself yeah and then the process of uh, recovery also the conversations during uh, the actual physiotherapy and all of those sessions is also pretty enjoyable so uh, not a plug in but i would definitely recommend everyone in bangalore to visit elevate oh, thank you so much and appreciate uh, that yeah i mean and this is a true you know customer testimonial so to say but uh, it you go a long way, you know, in helping out your uh, clients, uh, which is amazing in today's day and age where everything is about scale and numbers and mm. let me do this, all of that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the shout out. That's pretty cool. That's very <laughs> nice of you. Yeah. All right. So uh, moving to an important part of conversation, which is uh, around cricket. Uh, okay. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, cricket uh, uh, fanatics out there, especially in India, they are everywhere. Uh, side note: I'm not a big cricket fan, uh, but uh, you know, I appreciate people who uh, spend a lot of time building this amazing franchisee out there, especially the IPL or uh, you know, uh, people associated with that. We only see end up seeing glamour. We only see brand endorsements and the moolah and the money coming in advertisements, but people seldom think about what goes behind these superstars that we see on the screen. There's there's probably like a plethora of uh, uh, back-end people such as yourself building it out for them so that they can go out there and perform probably 200 days in a year, which is so amazing at such a high performance level. And you are an official team doctor for Kings 11 Punjab. So please uh, uh, dig in and share all your experiences. How did you get into it and how many years has it been? Sure. So, how do I get into it? I mean, uh, I mean, there are a lot of talented doctors out there. A lot mm-hmm. of them. I think it's sometimes it's also just being at the right place in the right time. And for, <laughs> that is the thing. I mean, I had to go through mm-hmm. an interview process and all of it. And once they were happy with the interview, they went through my referrals and uh, and it's 
also like even prior to getting into cricket i was the uh, team doctor for the indian team okay. at the asian para games oh. where you had to we went to indonesia with the entire like a uh, hundred members strong contingent there to take care of their injuries wow. and then i had to take care of a football team hockey team and all of it so all that adds up to your uh, experience and that's what uh, really helped up and that basically i had to go through an interview process and then mm-hmm. once they were happy with my references and all of it that mm-hmm. was it so with regards to what goes on behind the scenes mm-hmm. one thing in ipl and cricket these days is that the the support squad is almost as big as the entire team squad wow you have 25 players there you have at least 20 25 support staff over there you have different wow. kinds of coaches you have full time uh, masseurs attending to the players you have three two to three physiotherapists you have a team doctor and these guys travel with the team wow so wherever the team goes you see that many people with the team so it's a big very big support squad they have a Uh, some teams have a nutritionist on board so that because they're all constantly on the road they're constantly in mm-hmm. luxury hotels the whole time it, the chances of going falling off the wagon with your diet and all are very high yeah yeah, in, yeah. you're not free ideally you prefer home food yeah home food this is what i'm going to eat and that's what i would say optimal for your Absolutely. best for your optimal performance right but unfortunately that's a luxury cricketers don't have Oh, because they're all the time they're on the road. We only see they they staying in Marriotts and Tajes and uh, Radissons and you know, Lilas Absolutely. or Lalits and all of these things, and we think that wow, they are living an amazing life. They But that's true. That's true. I can I can vouch for this because you know my job also requires me to travel ten to fifteen days in a month in the hotels and all, and it is so damn easy to fall off the wagon, like you mentioned. Every yeah. meal is a buffet. <laughs> every meal is an option and it's so easy to give in yep. and no matter how strong willed you are you still end up giving in you do because it's like uh, i mean that's what happened like even in the ipl like mm-hmm. we end up staying in a luxury hotel for 3 months on the trot two and a half three oh. months on the trot mm-hmm. so i think uh, yeah we were right like, uh, the first ipl i went to is staying in this hotel called the sofitel okay. in on the in dubai okay and so you're like you now typically when you eat dinner at home you're happy to or in your room even forget about it if you order food to your room also you're happy to order let's say a pasta or something or a dal rice or so anything like hmm. maybe a biryani or something or dal rice or some new you're, you're happy to eat that meal and you're done with it hmm. but what happens in a buffet is that that dessert is sitting right in front of you and they like uh, and it's there every single day it becomes quite challenging to yeah. see, but no so yeah so cricketers as glamorous as it is they also quite uh, disciplined and all to to be you have to be disciplined uh, to stay on the mm-hmm. trail you know because your it is your job it is for you you have to go out there and perform mm-hmm. and especially with cricket i think it's a very high pressure job because uh everyone's for watching what you're doing on the field yeah. the entire country is entire you, country of cricket fans is like has its eyes on you so yeah. that uh, thing so yeah so that's the thing so cricket is pretty much that it has a lot of they have a lot of support staff they have a lot of resources at their disposal person so the support system is very good over there Okay uh, a quick question so uh, you get all types of players right some of them would be mega stars superstars some of them are up and coming uh, and as a team doctor it is your responsibility to make make sure that they show up every single day they are healthy they are in a happier state of being mm-hmm. uh, but there might be a lot of uh, psychological challenges that you might be facing you and your t- team might be facing in terms of uh you know handling these uh, mega stars so how do you like make sure that these guys are following all the instructions they are on the course all of that and uh, not you know throwing their weight around see that is there are certain things you can do there are certain things you cannot do okay okay we typically uh a lot of times when uh, the best thing you can do is when a player is undergoing their treatment they like to talk Mm. and once they talk and they'll get it out of the system most of them are quite 
ready to do their thing. Uh, <clears throat> at the end of the day, the rule is the same. Whether I see them in a team environment or whether I see a recreational athlete hmm. outside of the thing, hmm. I can only make recommendations. Okay. I can only give you the guidelines. Hmm. At the end of the day, you have to, it's hmm. up to you to follow them or not. And this is, it's the same rule, whether it's a, whether it's a player whether it's a high-profile player or a player who throws their weight around, or mm. whether it's a whether it's an amateur runner who's running, mm. let's say a Bangalore marathon or a Mumbai mm. marathon or something, mm. we can make the recommendation. We can give it to you. Mm. At the end of the day, you're a professional. <laughs> you need to understand the importance behind it. Nobody can force you to do anything, mm. and this rule holds true. We can't. We can't force anyone to do anything. We set certain rules. Certain rules and guidelines are yes mandatory, mm. which no even the even players who throw their weight around usually don't break such okay. rules. Okay. But uh, by default, medical guidelines, health guidelines, mm. you can make the recommendation. It's up to them to follow it on. If you're a true professional, you will think about the response. You will take responsibility and follow it. That's about it. Because at the end of the day, it's human. So you can't really, you can't be military and over there and say this, this, this. It doesn't work that way. Everyone comes from a very different and varied background. So you, mm -hmm. accordingly, you speak to each person like, and then take it forward that way. Any uh, anecdotes, uh, stories come to your mind in terms of uh, amazing experiences that you've had uh, as a as a doctor or maybe just as as an enthusiast of the sport uh, that's something that you probably as a non team doctor aspire to see uh, probably like a box ticket or something or travel with the players and now that fantasy or dream kind of came true something that comes to your Wait mind second, can you just uh, rephrase that question i didn't understand that uh... Uh, okay uh, I, i'm sure uh, you are also a fan of uh, team sports such as cricket yeah. and you would have had certain dreams that you know probably I should get a picture with so and so uh, player yeah. and uh, maybe sit and break bread with someone. Yeah. Any of those stories or anecdotes that? Uh, come to yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest, I think, uh, I mean, of course, everybody like uh, once when uh, Punjab were playing uh, Mumbai Indians, hmm. Sachin Tendulkar had come to the Mumbai Indians uh, dugout. Hmm. So, yeah. one of the things we did is like we went to the Mumbai Indians dugout, took a photo with Tendulkar, which is very difficult to get even for uh, even like it was not just me doing it hmm. even the junior cricketers were doing it you know it's not just the <laughs> just the support staff doing it even junior cricketers because for them that like, they've been playing they might have been playing cricket for the last 10 15 years and they've never met such in yeah, yeah so for them itself it was a thing so quite a few uh, things that we are uh, I mean it's good I mean of course uh, it, it's nice to see what happens in the IPL is that initially you're very awestruck with every all of the glamour, you know. Mm. Then every day you're eating breakfast and dinner with the same people every day. So you <laughs> kind of get used to it and you kind of get, and before you know it, you become a big family over there. So it's kind of, you get yeah. into a routine and uh, so it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite interesting that way because anecdotes, per se, yeah, the Tendulkar one is something I would, definitely highlight because something I went out of my way to get a picture with him but beyond that uh, whenever you get a chance it's, it's pretty cool you get to meet someone like a Dhoni or someone like that it's very interesting it's, it's, it's quite funny you like you'll be part mm. thing is you have to be professional at the end of the day you can't be <laughs> and uh, the fan boy, boy movement you can't do that you can't afford to do that then uh, so like I can like uh, we can be practicing in an and then Chennai or RCB will be packed in and you'll see Virat Kohli just batting, he's doing his batting over there but you can't just go there and uh, <laughs> interfere with it then you'll just get kicked out of the team. So you're you're supposed to maintain a professional stance. But yeah, cricket, it's fun. You you do get in these hmm. opportunities where like I think once I had to wait for like a good 20 minutes to get a picture of Harsha Bogle oh. who was a very interesting person I've always wanted to take a hmm. picture with him and he was very Compliant and most of these guys are very nice in terms of wow. taking pictures. Like Brian Lara was a very good uh, mm. 
mm. sport viewers agree to take a picture. So that's good. That way you there's a who's who of cricket, an opportunity to meet them and things. So it's quite uh, it's a very interesting uh, experience. Yeah. You you've been uh, associated with the IPL for about uh, how many seasons now? Three seasons. Three seasons. Of okay. 2020 have been so yeah. So. One is the actual event itself. Let's say three months that you mentioned that you are on the road. But yeah, how, what is the preparation like? How many months do you actually invest? In so what happens is there's no uh, from a team doctor perspective. I don't have much to do from a preparation perspective. Mm -hmm. In the sense, because all the of course during COVID, I had to make sure that all the players got their uh, vaccinations done and all mm -hmm. of it making sure, arranging for vaccination, making sure that's done. And if anybody turned uh, COVID positive, mm. how to help them with it, how to help them deal with the thing. Mm. The biggest challenge with IPL is that uh, all of these players are on different tours throughout the year. Yeah, They all get together just like two weeks before the tournament. So that's when you get together also. So this, so yeah, so pretty much that. I mean, and because we had the bubble and all the last two, three mm. years, we had to speak to the hotel people, make sure the bubble is intact, make sure that whatever we do for it is absolutely fine, exactly. make sure there's no breach in the bubble. Mm. And uh, so these are the kinds of, but per se, you don't have too much time to do any mm. prep because everybody's on the road playing a different tournament. Either they're playing international tournaments or domestic tournaments. And that, that's how IPL starts April 1st or March end. Mm. Everybody gets together like March 20th, March 19th. Mm. So that's how it uh, pretty much it. So there's no, if there is any injury, what happens is mm. any injury, I think during the off season of non IPL, they usually have their association okay. doctors or someone who take care okay. of, or the BCCI medical officer will take care of it. So okay. we don't have anything to do with it. With Understood. Understood. So, uh, so these are re actually high performance athletes, then they are. Uh, with all the uh, glitter and glamour that we see, but they are also constantly working on their craft and they are also performing at the highest level. And like you mentioned, they are constantly under scrutiny for every ball that they play right. in every uh, uh, match that they play. And so recovery is one of the most important things for them as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What are the, some of the recovery rituals? Do you do you see uh, all of these high performing people, yeah. like and Virat Kohli's and other? Yes. Players? So the the biggest advantage that they have is they have everything in one place. Okay. Okay. See now for optimal recovery, hmm. uh, it starts with prevention. Like even before you go into your practice session, you need to be rested. Yeah, yeah. Then you've already taken your first step towards recovering well from a mm -hmm. thing. Now, the biggest advantage any of these institutions have, any of these academies, just not cricket, even a, mm -hmm. a BFC, if, are they, what they have is like, uh, they have everything in one spot. Okay. They have your doctor, you have your physiotherapist, you have your nutritionist, you have your psychologist, you have your masters, masterists. We have everything in one spot. So, and it all comes down to how well those guys work, the support staff work amongst themselves. Mm. The physiotherapist needs to know, okay, if I get you from point A to point B. Beyond this, it's a strength and conditioning coach's job to take it. They point you in that direction. Or you go to the physiotherapist or a team doctor and they say, hey, this particular doesn't look like an injury, doesn't look like I think a massage should sort oh. it out. And you have that it happens right away. It's not like uh, mm. what happens to the recreational athlete is that you have to run from pillar to post. Right. That's what we've been trying. So that's one thing I tried to do once. I So I set up Elevate after going to the IPL. Wow. The whole point is to try and have a one point stop for everything. Mm. So because Bangalore, I mean, I, I'm talking about Bangalore in general because this is where I am. I know the yeah, sports yeah. medicine background. I know what's See, Bangalore has very good doctors. We have very good physiotherapists. We have good masters. You have a nutritionist. They have good nutritionists. So, but they're all in their own practices. Yeah. yeah. So what we are trying to do at, uh, what we try to do at Elevate, what I try to do at Elevate after talking about that, is to try and get all these services under one mm. roof. Mm. So if anyone comes to me to the clinic and says, 
which in this spectrum of issues, if they say anything is a problem, okay, I have a person who I can mm. connect you to right away. And the biggest, the most important thing over there, Nishant, is that you can still connect with other people. But what happens is you can go to a nutritionist. Say, I refer you to X nutritionist. No worries. Bless you. I refer you to X nutritionist. And uh, X nutritionist does pre prescribe mm. this, this, this. Mm. And they tell the client that. But mm. if that nutritionist doesn't communicate back to me directly, yeah. that's a big uh, gap. Because then the client's very confused. Because I can tell you, I can tell the client something. Nutritionists can tell the same thing using different words. Mm. Mm. It, both of us might be meaning the same thing, but we're saying the same thing using different words. It leaves the client very confused. So what we're trying to do is do the same thing. Get everything under one roof. Mm. And that will itself... So try and, you're trying to make the recovery environment mm. as optimal for the recreational athlete as it is for a high-performance athlete. That's the whole goal of it. So that's what happens. The recovery routine is that. They, mm -hmm. There's no fixed regime. Everybody have a different thing. Mm. Like some players like to get massages every week. Mm. Some players don't want a massage at all throughout the tournament. <laughs> so it depends. It goes very, very... And they both perform equally well. It's not that the okay. person who's getting the massage weekly is doing the right thing or it's not like the person who doesn't, hasn't gotten a massage is doing the right thing. Mm. Some people, there are some players who sleep at 11, 12 sharp, get up at 7 and they're... There are other players who sleep at 3 a.m. and wake up at lunchtime. Wow. So it doesn't... But again, when you go out on the field, they're all performing... Mm. equally good it's, so it doesn't really unfortunately there's no fixed formula there and the whole thing is having access to those uh, facilities and access, that's what makes the difference and I think recreational athletes also if they have mm. access to those facilities right place and right thing they should be having an optimal thing the biggest advantage professional athletes have over recreational athletes is that all they have to do is play yeah yeah yeah. They don't have to worry about a nine to five job <laughs> after training for three hours yeah. or after training for two hours. And I, which is why among the recreational athletes that I treat, I think I respect triathletes the most because it's, it's not just about training the sport. It's putting that in with yeah. such a, with your daily routine is not yeah. easy at all. It's probably one of the hardest things I can, because there is no coming back for a missed session. Yeah. You miss a session, that session is uh, You're gone. There is no time. Behind. Yeah. So that's the recovery formula. So it's just making sure you have access to the right facilities right. makes a lot of difference. Absolutely. I think a great point in terms of, you know, uh, people, especially like us, uh, recreational athletes who, and, uh, who have access to resources, but yet... Uh, you know, think about let let me get this fancy equipment, let me get this massage, let me get all of that. But the the essence of all of it is that if you can actually have everything in one place, because yeah. everything is connected. It's not like one massage or one equipment or one theragun Good would thing. actually solve anything. It it has to be interconnected. It has to be value driven, action driven, and outcome driven. That's that's uh, more important. It has to be also be very very customized to your requirement and not Absolutely. be a hair say that you know probably this boot has worked for me so it will also work for you this compression I run with the compression sleeves on so you should also do that because yeah. even I am in the same sport and all of that that right. is right. probably not the best approach correct you're absolutely right about that so you're right that's true it, it is a very customized approach mm. and uh, like even with the mass word or something if I can send you to a master or a master so I can communicate to mm. and tell them, hey, this I need this area seen a little bit more tight, mm. work more on this, take it easy on the other parts. They do that. Yeah. And because otherwise you just go to a master like, mm. and they just keep, uh, there's no application, you know, it's just like you do a generic treatment. So that yeah. really changes the thing. Yeah, yeah. I think that feedback, that live feedback and that interconnectivity in all the areas is super important for actually being able to 
go go back and come back uh, and perform at the same level i think that's uh, you're, that's you're right. you're absolutely right but uh, moving to the last section of our uh, discussion uh, and uh, segueing towards the triathletes now mm -hmm. triathlon is fairly new in india there have been people who have been doing it for a couple of decades also but far and few we all know uh, right. somehow it has kind of taken off after iron man goa in 2019 and then again right. in 2022 uh, and we see that right now the tribe is probably around uh, 3000 to 4000 people in the entire country which is still right. on the higher side i think number might actually be around 3000 4000 but it is slated to increase to uh, 10000 in a year or so and then probably uh, leap frog from there so okay. uh, what are what is your advice to newbie triathletes who have who are just getting into their first race or probably have done a race in last season also what are some of the recovery rituals that a newbie triathlete should try to inculcate on a daily basis correct so basically <clears throat> so when you talk sorry when you think about uh, recovery right like i was uh, talking about the cricket also the recovery for that day's workout starts the previous night hmm. you have not slept well you already predisposed yourself for some sort of injury Oh. so let me so before coming to why what i'm talking about recovery mm -hmm. let me tell you how uh, injuries occur in the first mm, place yes please so that when we have how when we know how injuries occur mm. then we know how what we can do to prevent uh, yes. recoveries in the time mm -hmm. now when we talk about injury there are two types of injuries mm. there is one is the acute or the freak injury mm. and then there is also a chronic or a overload injury okay Okay, so an acute or a freak injury is something that could be a bike accident. Mm. You could trip and fall. You could. Sure. It's unpredictable. You don't know what is happening, and, and, and unfortunately, that's not in our mm. control. I've had people, I've known friends who mm. who traveled all the way to Turkey and everywhere for the Ironman, mm. and uh, he was going for his uh, bike, uh, stressing out his bike the day prior, mm. had a fall, couldn't participate. Oh, So these things are, I mean, they happen, but we can't do anything about it. So that that doesn't come into this today's uh, discussion. That's a this mm. that's a topic on its own. Mm. Uh, mm. Other thing is what we call as a chronic or overuse injury. Mm. Now, typically, a chronic or an overuse injury happens because of either the muscle imbalance, mm. any. like one leg being stronger than the other or one leg one side taking more load than the other or something mm -hmm. that's one thing another issue that ha typically happens is again the lack of uh, adequate recovery mm -hmm. lack of uh, adequate uh, nutrition okay lack of uh, strength training mm -hmm. these are the things or uh, or it could be lack of it or it could be inappropriate mm -hmm. i mean i know people who go like uh, who go to the gym mm. uh and uh, like these are the runners and triathletes they go to the gym and they say i'm going to go to the gym i'm going to i go to the gym but what do you do in the gym i do squats with 5 kg i do squats with mm -hmm. like, which is okay i mean but it's not enough to prevent or reduce your risk of injury when you're taking part in a track um, yeah. you need to be stressing out your tissues a lot more to think mm -hmm. it just but then i don't blame them it's just lack of awareness and that's the whole yeah. thing that's what it is so these are the main reasons like lack of strength training lack of nutrition inadequate rest or inappropriate strength training inappropriate nutrition inadequate rest and imbalance these are the mm -hmm. things that typically predispose you for a injury mm -hmm. or thing so basically when we talk about top steps for recovery or top steps for thing the goal is to reduce your risk of injury that's why we are doing all of this mm. the goal is to reduce your risk of injury the goal is to ensure that you can continue doing your sport without as optimally as possible without mm. any breaks without any mm. and then once you achieve this over a certain period of time then you think of scaling up your performance mm. so the if you ask me what i would tell the newbies mm. the take home thing for them is first get consistent with the practice of training mm. just get used to training every day 
get used to think. Don't hmm. expect a PB every time you race. <laughs> it is if that was the case, and everyone should be, yeah. you should have every Ironman, you should have a world record. <laughs> yes. so, I mean, the top athlete. So you don't expect a PB every time. Get into the habit of training. Training. And then once you've gotten into the habit of training where it feels like a second nature to you, where it doesn't feel like you're mm -hmm. then you can think of scaling up your Ironman, or not Ironman, sorry, your triathlon training. You can think of scaling up your triathlon training, either in terms of getting faster at that particular distance mm -hmm. or building up your endurance and cooking at a long bigger distance. distance. If you're doing a sprint, you want to scale it up to an Olympic or an Ironman, do it then. So that's yeah. And everybody has a different progression rate. Mm. One of the biggest challenges I saw in 2019 was that I, at that point of time, I used to also teach uh, swimming, open water swimming. I used mm. to take classes. I had a lot of people who registered for 2019 Ironman and then they came to learn swimming. Which is not the smartest way to... I am also you know. guilty of that, but it's oh, okay. Sorry? I'm also guilty of that, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they are not the smartest way to go about it. But, uh, but you wouldn't tell anyone now. As a coach, you wouldn't tell that to... I hope not. That's not... Uh, thing. So my, my case was completely different, you know. I had registered for the uh, race and I did not even have a cycle. And okay. I had never swum in my life. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So okay. the race was uh, October 2020, uh, 2019. Correct. And uh, I bought a cycle in December 2019 and uh, till about January, February, I did not know how to swim also. So I, I started oh, wow. watching YouTube videos from the month of February 2019. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> I learned swimming by watching YouTube videos. I wow. used to watch videos for like 45 minutes, go in the pool and practice kicking for 45 minutes. Then, you know, all of the, all of those things. And over a course of uh, two months, I used to watch videos, go in the pool, practice, come oh, out, watch videos. And nice. then two months, by, I think I started March, I think February or March 2019. And in May 2019, I learned first time how to swim. Oh, wow. was... <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a huge risk. I mean, but yeah. just I mean, knowing you now, yeah. you're quite fast at picking up your... Uh... Think so it'll worked out for you. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it might, like I said, everybody have a very different, different uh, learning uh, curve. Not learning recommended curve. at uh, don't, Not, don't mean, try this stunt at home or if you're as if you're as fit and as talented Nishan as Nishan, definitely you can do it, but not highly <laughs> thing. But yeah, the thing is for recovery, like basically you need to make sure you've rested the previous day. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you follow a discipline, I know this sounds very cliche, mm -hmm. but it still comes down to that. Following a disciplined uh, nutrition, making sure yeah. your sleep is all right, making sure your training load is added. Yeah, optimal. Yeah. Like we discussed earlier in a talk, uh, sometimes with triathlon especially, it's a very tight training schedule. Mm -hmm. And sometimes work, life gets in the way and you have to miss a session or two. Yeah. Don't try to make up for that uh, miss session. It's gone. You can't, in order to try and make up for that miss session, you might end up overtraining and that might predispose you for a really mm -hmm. It's easier to let go of a miss session than to try yeah. and catch up for that. So that's the thing. And always listen to your body. It just mm -hmm. makes a lot of uh, difference. Sometimes you don't wake up fresh, you don't wake up thing, and you're really tired when you wake up mm -hmm. in the morning. Uh, don't push it through. Mm. And at that point in time, you're going to feel guilty about not going for that session. True. But worst case, you, know, you end up going for a session and something happens then. Mm. You're knocked out for a longer period of time from your training. Mm. So, yeah, that's the thing for recreational athletes. Build it up, build it up slowly, gradually, learn to enjoy the sport. Yeah. Then think of scaling up your uh, yeah. performance. Very... Uh... A peculiar thing I've picked up from your uh, explanation about uh, rituals that a triathlete can actually take up. And uh, you've actually touched to the very foundation of what is required for recovery and not uh, focus on 
the fancy equipments that are out there of course those are important things and i would like your opinion also on the matter but uh, it's i think something that those three four points that you've told us about sleep uh, about tri- optimal nutrition op- optimal load uh, the mm-hmm. progression in your training which has to be uh, designed in a way which is not exceeding let's say the 10% uh, weekly limit uh, these are things that everyone i can actually uh, built into their rituals right uh, routines Correct. uh what are your thoughts on the cutting edge technology tools okay. that we have including let's say the normatech boots or the yes. uh, hyperized guns uh sure. various uh, stra- straps and uh, yeah. uh, ice therapy cold therapy heat therapy all of these things that are available out there in the market what are your thoughts on it okay so when we talk about these kind of recovery modalities they call modalities okay okay uh they basically what we call as passive modalities all right all right uh, so now these are good tools to mm-hmm. use but at the same time they're not mandatory tools okay you okay. it's like uh, i mean I'm, i'm quite sure someone it's it's really nice it's a very good convenience to have like if mm-hmm. i can have someone who can just come and massage my feet at the end of the day every day that mm-hmm. would be something that would be really good but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing out there so see the end of the day these passive modalities can only do so much mm. if my if my fundamentals are not in place mm. the passive modalities can only do so much it's a good supplementary tool mm. when everything else is in place yeah. if i don't sleep well i go to a workout and i end up being very sore and if i have to depend on a on an hyperized gun or any gun for that matter any massage gun to help me feel better the fact that the very fact that i need to depend on this gun after every session mm. tells me that something is wrong with my training room right does that make sense absolutely 100% so it's good it's a good tool but you shouldn't be dependent on those any of there are a lot of different things there are people like even when it comes to rehabilitation mm-hmm. as much as possible we try to make people do exercise yeah first session you come in we might do a little bit of needling or a little bit of myofascial release or trigger point different different modalities out there just to loosen up that muscle mm. growth but that is just like a bandage mm. so your compression socks or your your icing and all these are all like just bandages it will help you recover from that session but you shouldn't be in that position after each training session that you require that mm. your body your load should be such that your body can get back to its normal without depending on it if you're getting if you're being dependent on that then this you need to revisit what's happening in the training same thing with the rehab also first one or two sessions we do a little bit of release work and you know. mm. post that it's only focusing on strength training it's all about making you enabling you to be able to not require a release not require a thing. i'm not saying these modalities are bad mm-hmm. but the frequency you use it the dependency on it is something you need to reflect back upon absolutely yeah so that's the thing with gadgets it's it's there there's always a new gadget out there yeah. so yeah. it's not a i think uh, gadgets are something which uh... end up enhancing your performance but that uh, you have to cross the bridge you on your own you have to be there at probably that 80 90% level you have to be there and the yeah. last 20 25% it will just help you to you're yeah, 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 right i mean i'm no that's absolutely true because see there's no end to the number of gadgets out there yeah, yeah. number one it's the same thing with nutrition because a lot of things people talk about nutrition and its role in recovery mm. and then i have people who come to me and saying uh this particular company selling this supplement this supplement and they talk about six or seven supplements mm-hmm. and they say at this time take this this time take this this time take this this time take now when you look at those supplements individually they do help they do make a difference how much they're helping you can't measure it yeah it's yeah. the same thing with the gadgets you can't objectively or physically measure yeah yeah how much it's making a difference absolutely so i think when it comes to gadgets and uh nutritional supplements and all i think it's a it's a very individual choice mm. where uh depending i mean triathlon is an expensive sport let's they're not kidding around it 
So yeah. depending on how much you want to invest right. into it, you take a call based on that because there is no end to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you can go to the extent, if you have the resources and all, you can go to the extent of getting a liquid nitrogen chamber installed at home. <laughs> you can go after an entire day, three minutes, your body will go to sub, uh, very close to zero. You'll and, and enhances, supposedly enhances your recovery in your back. Mm-hmm. And you can do that. Or you can have like a, a contrast bath at home where you have two showers. One shower is putting hot water. One shower is putting uh, mm-hmm. ice cold water and you can keep switching. So there's no <laughs> end to the yeah, yeah. gadgets and resources. It's it's something is within your means, within your things. And uh, I think it also comes to a very... Uh, anecdotal experience what I feel is like uh, if you felt good after doing a massage or you felt good after using a massage gun mm-hmm. by all means do it yeah. but if you don't feel good after it not necessarily that everyone will feel Absolutely. good after it if you don't feel good after it don't do it so that's Absolutely. simply that that's the 100% I think uh, uh, it's a more customized kind of experience overall also but that those levels also you'll only be able to understand once you've been through the journeys and the cycles in the yeah. sport for at least two or three years or maybe four years even yeah. longer yeah. at the end of the day what I've, i end up seeing especially the where we started the discussion was that it's a new sport in india and a lot of yeah. new things are coming up a lot of new people are coming in so that also means there's a lot of borrowed knowledge there's a lot yeah. of uh googled knowledge which is available which is probably very generic in nature but if you continue to apply those kind of borrowed experiences in your own experience without having to having gone through the right channels of a qualified coach or a qualified yeah. doctor who's also been able who's also followed the journey for a few clients patients right. and customers and not just be theoretical nature that's when you will be actually able to uh, get the right value out of it otherwise there could also be uh drastic you know uh, experiences out there because uh, i mean let's face it this is not one of the easiest in fact it is the hardest it uh, is oh, yeah. uh, you just like for all the athletes out there it is one of the hardest endurance sports out there actually right uh, that's what it is called also but if you don't actually respect the process and go through it mm-hmm. in science and sports science and data based approach you will certainly end up uh getting injured so, right. the process yeah on that note nishan i mean there is always a little bit of trial and error this happens to all athletes but you have to be smart with how much you want to trial because yeah. that will decide you don't want to make any drastic experiments i mean it's good to have a general guideline and then you play around a bit with it there will be a little bit of trial and error because like you said, not necessarily that one thing works for everyone. Absolutely. So, yeah, but you're right. It's uh, better to be a little safe when take it a little slower than to rush into it. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sh- uh, Srinan Srinivas, you have been a pleasure. It has been such an amazing, uh, you know, experience, a learning process for me also. Uh, I'm sure whoever listens to this today would uh, go back uh, adding to their knowledge uh, uh, you know, base and experience, any parting shots, any parting thought that you would like to share with the audience? Oh, uh, no, I mean, uh, so yeah, I can uh, can give you my booking link, but hopefully you don't have to use it at any point of uh, <laughs> time. But uh, no, there's no, see, uh, what uh, the only thing I would tell an audience thing is, if you, if you start noticing any niggle, mm-hmm. any sort of discomfort, have it checked. Have it checked. It might be overkill, but have it checked. Make sure it's nothing before it becomes into mm. something that forces you to take time off. Yeah. You know, yeah. that before it becomes something, you feel that something is off and you feel that it's mm. not a thing. Definitely have it checked by a medical professional. And uh, mm. yeah, that should be the thing. Be, just don't, don't ignore it. That's the only, no. that's what I would tell people. Awesome. And uh, any uh, races in your bucket list, any specific uh, sports or events that you would like to do in the near future? Uh, for me, the near future is just to get back into a regular fitness uh, routine. But I did run the Mumbai yeah. half last month. But uh, the thing is to get back into routine. Probably the 
next event I'm targeting is if I'm in town is the TCS uh, 10K that happens in Bangalore in May. Yeah. That for now, I'm just sticking to this year, probably sticking to recreational running. All right. I might get back to open water swimming uh, next year. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and uh, recovery rituals, Dr. Srinan. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. I will be putting all the links to uh, Dr. Srinan's profile in the show notes and uh, will also tag you. Feel free to reach out to him in DMs or, you know, in the comment section for any specific questions. And if you guys are in uh, Bangalore, need any help, uh, I will also put the reservation link in there. That's Probably right. make an appointment and <laughs> go visit him. If nothing, you will end up uh, coming back so much more happier and enriched with, the, you know, meeting him for sure. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great pleasure being able to have this discussion because there's so many questions that people want to ask, but they don't know how to ask. And I think through this platform, you, you've you asked for all those 3,000 triathletes, you've asked a lot of questions, what they want to ask, but they've not been, they don't know whom or where to ask. And I think that's a really, that's a really nice thing of you to do. So that Thank it just so gives a lot of people a lot of opportunity to learn. It really makes a lot of difference. For sure. Like I was mentioning uh, when we were uh, pre-recording, uh, that you know i'm a i'm being selfish uh, for my athletes and for myself to learn more and you know short chain the learning curve because experts such as yourself who have spent 20 years in a field are coming down and funneling and every you know distilling everything in an hour that's, that's just amazing that's one way of looking at it yeah <laughs> another way of looking at it is what they've always taught us is like when you teach other people you actually learn your subject better Better. And this I know this for a fact because every time I explain uh, the same condition, let's say somebody has a, a IT band pain or a knee and the pain in the knee. Every time I explain this to a client, mm -hmm. each time I explain it, I'm learning something about it, and I learn to explain to explain it better. So it's a two-way learning thing. It's not just uh, it's not a selfish thing at all. <laughs> I think uh, enough of uh, we've been eating a lot of humble pie this evening. Thank you so much once again no for uh, taking out your time and uh, sharing your beautiful thoughts with us. Thank oh, you so thank much. Thank you so much, Nishan. Okay. That, right. hey, uh, guys, uh, please subscribe to the channel Trifantry and uh, let's continue to train in your conquer life. That was Dr. Srinan Srinivas. I hope you enjoyed the conversation on recovery. Uh, the Basic principles that he talked about were uh, the recovery starts much before the actual day itself. It starts with seven to eight hours of sleep. It starts with the right diet. It starts uh, with sticking to the basics, warming up, cooling down, uh, taking care of your macro and micronutrients. And then uh, <clears throat> if you have been regular with your pro uh, the training schedules, you've been growing progressively in your training, then you can look, look at uh, getting the external gadgets also, which might end up enhancing your performance and give you faster and fresher uh, body to come back again. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what is important is sticking to the basics, uh, getting your right amount of sleep, uh, uh, getting the right diet, getting uh, the adequate, uh, you know, supervision from the right qualified coaches so that you don't uh, overload or underload that's when you can truly unlock your true potential. I hope, I sincerely hope that you guys enjoyed the uh, conversation today. Uh, I will bring the next episode out soon. Continue to train in your conquer in life. Reach out to me on Daily Fit with Nishant on the Instagram page. You can also follow Trifantry Fitness on Instagram. You obviously have to subscribe to the channel here at uh, Trifantry. Thank you and continue to train in your conquer.